A very good evening and thank you for joining us. Welcome to the program. My name is Josephine Karunji and tonight we continue our conversation on preparing for retirement. I have the same team I had from last week, stayed behind to record this particular session. But once again, for somebody who's just tuned in, I'll introduce them. Sitting right next to me is uh, Benjamin Mchibi, who is the Head of Research and Sector Development at the Uganda Retirement Benefits Regulatory Authority, OPRA. Welcome, Benjamin. Thank you once again. Well, thank you for staying behind, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, over there we have Bernice Mbano, who is a wealth manager with Stanbic Bank, and she's also a financial ad advisor or planner. Uh, Bernice, thank you for staying behind. And finally, we have Ronald Mukasa, who is a financial literacy coach. He has worked extensively with small and medium enterprises, offering uh, financial training and advisory services. Welcome. All Thank you, Josephine. All right. Well, let's say it as it is. So like I mentioned earlier, we, we are continuing our conversation with uh, planning for retirement. And um, I want us to break it down a bit this week on, on what do I have on my checklist if I'm planning to retire? What things do I have to look at and say I have to get this done, I have to plan for this? I know health insurance is a big deal. Can we start there? Mm. Because I know that in old age, at about 70, your body is really giving way. You, you, you're prone to all of these things coming up. Especially since we don't really have the, we don't exercise much, we don't, you know, do a lot, eat healthy. How do I plan for my health insurance so that I'm not relying on um, my NSSF money no. or I'm not relying on my children to be the ones taking care of that? Mm. And there was silence. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, I think uh, really when you're looking at uh, the, the issue of uh, retirement, there are a number of things you have to consider. Uh, the first thing is disposable income, because it's what drives everything during retirement. But uh, the issue of health is very critical, and uh, that's why insurance comes in. And there are a number of issues about what kind of product is suitable for somebody in that uh, cohort. So the, the issues about uh, whether the retirement savings are adequate enough to manage a product on the market and uh, these are things that uh, an average person is worried about because the premiums tend to be high but uh, there are creative ways of managing it so if you're talking about insurance health insurance may not necessarily mean insurance with the company because there are products that can be useful for you that are ranked at institutional level I have uh, I know so many examples within the country that are made I don't know if you've experienced uh, where ins they have cards in uh, institutions like in Mbarara mm. mm. and even in some places in Kampala where you have cards and you have an arrangement, especially if you have, if the institution has history, your history in terms of health and understanding, your doctors are there, they manage you and then you make... Also, you're, you're, when you say institution, I was, I was getting a bit confused. So um, the health facility? The health facility. Okay. Normally people go to health facilities and they build relationships with the doctors mm. there and the managers of the hospital. So people who know you well, you engage them and then you chart out a plan on how to manage the okay. risks that they've identified. So that's one of them. That's not to say that you can explore an insurance policy as well, because what makes it cheaper is the groupness. When you have a group of people on the same policy, it's easier. The challenge we have is that when we think about health, we think about ourselves alone. But if you have a number of people, or if you look at products that insurance companies have, then you can elect to choose a product that has a critical mass, but then you look at what it is they're providing. Because sometimes the premiums are high just because of what they're providing. Maybe just to comment on mm. what you said about if I put in five million, then I don't fall sick. Maybe what we need to understand also is when you take out an insurance, you're really paying for that peace of mind to know that in the event that something happens, because it's like us. We, we, we use the is very expensive. <laughs> 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 we use the same argument that I've not got an accident, so they've not given me my money, they've taken my money and all that. But when you do it, the peace of mind of knowing that, God forbid if something happened or I got an accident, I'm I know covered. that I'm, yes, okay. I know that I'm covered. But in regards to the health policies also, sometimes they're more expensive depending on what they cover. Like mm -hmm. Some cover critical illness, which covers maybe cancer, diabetes, and things like that mm -hmm. so the onus is on us now to sit and actually ask exhaustively until we are comfortable okay what does this cover and some can feel okay maybe we can leave out this I want I'm more interested in 
critical illness, maybe because of my family history and things like okay. that. So that you get something that works for you. And at times, yes, they're expensive. Um, but at times, the earlier you take it, the better. Because again, it's harder for an insurance company to take you up when you're older yeah. because you're a higher risk to them. So if you can start a bit earlier, it makes it, it, makes it easier. Uh, another thing that comes to mind on, on this checklist, and you people should be giving me the checklist, but mm. I feel like I'm not giving it to you. Mm. Mm. Yes. Education, especially when, when you have children uh, at an older age, so maybe mm. you're, you're 60 or 70 and your kids are 10. Mm. Now you're thinking, I need to educate them until they're after university, mm. but I'll be retired, so my, my retirement money is going to be to educate children, mm. Mm. not to take care of myself. Mm. Mm. How do you plan around that? I personally look at education as a way of avoiding a higher cost. When you give your children a good education, you actually possibly give them a better chance in life and that better chance in life at least helps them live so that you don't have to look after them in their what? In their and old age. It might also age. help yes. you because they yes. are yeah, they look after you. <laughs> they are, they they are good children, you. they will also have to come back to what? To look, to look after, after you. Uh, mm. And that's a choice which they have to make. But mm. at the very least, I think what is in your power is mm. you want to give a very decent education. So yeah. that means that today and now, you need to ask yourself, am I actually... You can't use the costs of today as the basis of how much you'll need to, 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 to educate your child in the future. Mm -hmm. So you need to actually put that into, into place. But also I think one of the things which is important is, is, to, is to look at the, the education which you are giving, not as a, an, a, an investment which you are making for yourself. I think that's another dangerous thing to do say I will pour all my money into the, into the education policy and then when that child gets that dream job I can expect 500 from so them every month. That, is, that, so that, that I think is a very dangerous argument. Mm. It's a very dangerous argument. I mean your child may be glad and I think most children are honored to look after their parents. Mm. It's an honor to but the exceptions. Back. Mm. Yes but really? I mean the point is that you do not have a contract with them. You can't, uh, you can't say that by the you remember in uh, 1990 and 2000, I was the one who, it, it doesn't work that way. So you need, you need to actually appreciate that. So yeah. you need to look at education as part of the responsibilities you have. I think one key thing is that it's, it's getting more expensive by mm. the day. So you need to, to pay attention and say, have I put aside sufficient resources? Because sometimes, you, you, you start a policy which won't be sufficient, even then you would still need more money. Yeah, at that to, point to do that. Uh, what, when we're having a break and we're having this conversation, and I remember, Benjamin, you were talking about uh, do, 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 we, do, this, do we want to actually pay school fees for our s children in university? You know, <laughs> the selfishness that might have to come into play in planning for your retirement. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, first, uh, I would like to mention. Uh, just to graft onto the earlier discussion, mm. that uh, the endowment policies for education are available on the market. Yeah. So if you get children late, that's one of the channels because that's the commitment the insurance company makes to you. Mm. So you make contributions so that even when you are away, your children can get an education. I yes. don't know if, if the, the generation before us will totally agree because they were, they were cultured, I don't know if that's the right word, mm. to take care of community, so mm -hmm. you take care of your brother's children, your sister's children, your, your great-grandchildren, your great you know, you take care mm -hmm. of the children. You mm -hmm. think about yourself last because you want them to have a, a, a better future, you know? Mm -hmm. I, I don't know, I think, I think the way I look at it, it is, um, it's not an either-or question. It is, you want to be able to support your family, to put them in a position that they can be able to support themselves. However, I don't think that support should take away their responsibility. And I think sometimes as you try to look out for your family, you look out to a point where you disarm them. They don't actually need to do anything. So if you are the uncle who has been solving all problems, someone is uh, starting a family, for example, and his grand plan is to use your resources to run this <laughs> family. So that, 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 that is totally unacceptable. You see, so I, I feel like that's the responsibility which Benjamin is talking okay. about. Mm -hmm. there, is, there, is, there is a point where you are supposed, I feel like giving a decent education to your children is in a way cutting your future costs because we have seen families where parents have chosen not to educate their children and, uh, 
and the children are waiting for the parents to die. They are saying, you should die because I want to take your what? <laughs> your your property. Your so that, that, that's a possibility. So okay. there, is, there is that responsibility you have. But however, there has to be a balance. Okay. You shouldn't disarm mm. the, the person's responsibility. And people have capacity to actually survive. You may say, if that child doesn't get that extra paper, they won't be able to make it. But they will. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, another thing that I wanted to ask about is, is the decision of where do I live in my retirement? We are checking off this list, right? Mm -hmm. So we've done health, education, but then now where do I live in my retirement? Am I going to go to uh, our home in, in, in there or am I going to, to <laughs> settle within where we bought a house here in mm -hmm. Kampala? What's, what, 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 what works? I think. What do you have to consider when you're making that decision? Because I'm thinking that if I, if I decide to retire mm. deep down there, everybody I know is here. Mm. Doesn't the loneliness in, in some way mm. affect you? Doesn't, you know? And I think some have a challenge with that because there's nothing that says when you retire you must go here. For all intent and purposes, I've met people who said when I retire I want to go to, to the UK, I want to go to France and I'm okay retiring there. Or in the same way you've heard of Europeans who want to retire in Africa. And you'd think, but why wouldn't you want to retire in your home? Why would you but want to come? But your friends are very rich. <laughs> someone, <laughs> someone else. Now, I guess the point I'm trying to make is that is a decision you both have to see where you can retire. There both others, of you? If you're going to retire together, yes. yes. You know, you discuss together. And you might find for many, they want to retire back in the village. And I find at times there's a disconnect. If you talk to people our age, like the way you're saying, all my friends are here. Um, I want to retire in Kampala, and it's not a bad thing, by the way, if you want to retire here. Then for others, you find, because our parents maybe grew up there, they are more connected there, we are also from there, but for them it's much easier to settle in, because that is where they grew up from. You find that is where they want to go. So I think it just depends on, it's, it's up to you really, where you want to settle and to do the things that you like. Where is that place that speaks to you? One thing that comes to mind is, what is this that you are retiring from? And what are you retiring to? <laughs> yeah. Because that's very important. Because if you have been in Kampala and no. you have been doing uh, manual labor or you are in a place where yes. people are changing, and, you know, you're downtown, every time new people, you don't have any networks. So when you stop doing what you are supposed to do, like if you are doing hard labor or you have a shop and you're no longer able, mm. then you're out of town, you're out of uh, downtown, then where do you go? So if you cannot go to the village, and in Kampala is very expensive, where do you go to? Mm -hmm. So we have to think about that as well. Because if you are somebody who has been building networks, you've been working for different agencies, mm -hmm. and you have colleagues in the same cohort who are also retired, mm -hmm. it's yes. easier. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you have find the workplace with just one or two people who are retiring. Mm -hmm. So you stay home and read the papers. Then after the papers, what? Then if you're paying rent, you don't have a house, then rent is an issue. Then you would rather go home. Yeah and then you manage life there because there's no income for you to be wasting. You need to be using it to enjoy your life. So if you have some savings, it's better to think about the best place to be in terms of managing your life. Okay. Yeah, uh, let me add one thing. I think you have to notice that now you have to build those networks. I mean, yeah. even going home can be a complex thing. Yes. I mean, if you have been away <laughs> for, for 30, 30 years, years and then <laughs> you are returning to the people, it, it just doesn't work <laughs> Which people? Away. Yes. Half I mean, of they, them they, are they, not they there are going anymore. To be uncomfortable there. So yeah. I, think, I think you need to actually factor mm. that in. If you, if you think you want to retire, I mean, how are you impacting the community which you want to yeah. retire into? Are mm. you part of the, the community initiatives? So I, th I think it may be a bit difficult to just have finished and mm. um, and and then I've come back. I mean, that's 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 a struggle. Some people who live in Europe, for example, you you say I want to return to my country, but you no longer have the what mm. the connection. Yeah, so it is ties. it's mm. kind of an important thing to build that connection. But secondly, I think there are also some basics. I mean, uh, getting into retirement without a home when you are renting is a very dangerous thing to do. And and some people have to face that reality that I'm actually still renting and. I am going into my retirement. All right. So, Ronald, I want us to start yes. from, from our homes actually yes. when we come back, but let's mm. take a short break now mm. and we'll speak off from there. We offer professional barber, hairdressing at Lugogo Mall, Garden City, Forest Mall, Oasis Mall, and Acacia Mall. Sparkle Saloon, professional, affordable, and quality services.
Welcome back. We're still talking tonight about uh, planning for retirement and we're talking about homes. I was reading um, ahead of this conversation um, on Forbes list on five things to prepare for before you retire and they mentioned uh, houses and home repairs and mortgages and things like that and you mentioned building a house or, or where you're going to retire to. Mm -hmm. Yes. No, I, th I think I think it's an abs it's a simple thing but it's an absolutely important thing. You You need to ask yourself does that home exist? I mean, if you're going back to the village, is the home there? Or it's something which you need to do with five years into your retirement and you say, I need to start doing this. So you need to actually tick that box and make sure that it's there. If, you're, if your finances are stable that you can rent comfortably. For the rest of for, your for life. For the rest mm -hmm. of your life. Uh, well, wow. I, I, think, I think there's a place for that. But I think for, in the context of most, of most of us, it is you have to have that home. And sometimes I feel like you keep postponing this mm. decision. And mm. part of it sometimes is this argument about a dream house. The, the, the <laughs> passion for do, building a dream house sometimes takes away the necessity of building just a home. A I mean, you, you build it and if, you, if resources allow, you build another dream house. But that, that, that has to exist. So sometimes you find people, you are, you're about to hit 50 and you're saying, I'm still waiting for my dream what? My dream house. And then 60 comes and you haven't yet done it. And then there is a problem. So I think that that's, that's, that's a conversation you have to have with your spouse and yeah. make sure that actually, what are we going to do? Where are we going to stay? Mm. A and another conversation I think I'd like us to have still on this checklist is, so I retire and then tomorrow morning I wake up, maybe I'll sleep in because I'm, oh, I don't have to get up to go to work. A week later, what am I doing in the morning? You know, how do you plan for how you're going to spend your time in your retirement? Yes, uh, there are a number of things that you can do because uh, you're only retiring from uh, the active work that you've been doing. He mentioned about networks, but it's very important that even when you're at work, you make sure that you engage your community, you're part of activities, community activities, you go to church, you're part of charity, Rotary. These are things that you can do when you retire. You're a Rotarian? N no, not oh, yet. Okay. But uh, these are experiences uh, <laughs> that uh, when we attend, when we get people that talk to us about retirement, those that seem to be active, actively enjoying mm. a part of something. It Networks. could be, yes. You know, there are these uh, women's groups, mm. they are, the Rotary Club is doing very well. They, they meet every time and they discuss about a number of things and through those networks you become useful yeah. you can become a mentor then you go to board you become a board member because normally at the lottery you find people from different backgrounds different professionals mm -hmm. company owners and if they know who you are you can be engaged as a board member as an advisor as a mentor at church you can be a church leader the number of things you can do, you could also volunteer within those institutions. In addition to what he has said also, I think also to discover what are those things that you like. You know, you're doing that, but it's nice also to do what you enjoy and you like. Have the groups you're connected to because they keep you, I like what he said, rotary groups. You're active, you wake up to something and sometimes fulfilling. Maybe you're mentoring, you're giving back, you're giving back to society. But also take time to think, okay, what do I, what do I like to do? Because indeed, every day you wake up, then what? And that shouldn't be the feeling. You should look forward to a new day. And we pray that during your lifetime, you build relationships. Because I like to say life is about people and relationships. You cannot be alone, because it can be so lonely. Let's talk about paying off debt. Because if you say you're working, and maybe you have a mortgage, or you're paying for a car. I mean, some people are still paying for a car mm -hmm. at a later stage in life that mm -hmm. they've, they've acquired. And now you're planning for your retirement. How do you work towards getting that paid off so that you, debt is not following you, you know, into your, your retirement? One is first of all to understand the debt that you have. Mm -hmm. You know, many times you can be so deep in debt, you're borrowing and this man is paying this one and the other one is paying this one. So you can be in a deep, in a deep hole. Because as you're planning for retirement, maybe you're now 40 and it's in 20 years to come or 25 years to come. How much time do you need to cover that debt or that loan? So to break it down and actually understand to the detail, who do I owe money? How long does it take to pay? Even a mortgage has a, it's pegged to something, either your salary or something at a certain point it will. Because now to plan for your retirement and to stop working in the middle of all these things that are pegged to the salary that you are earning becomes a problem. Mm -hmm. So I think it's just looking at your, having a financial mirror and saying, okay, these are the debts I have, and actually write them down and look at them and then see, okay, for instance, I know people who can work for 
10 years to have the children first, grow and be a certain age, then they leave. It's like it's purposeful. So it's not wrong to say, I'm going to continue working here until at least I've finished this and then I move. Because remember, that is your solution to that. Or if you want to retire, then what is going to pay those debts? But it starts with, let me understand my financial situation now. Okay. Mm -hmm. well, no, I, think, I think I'll just add something small to what Bernice has mentioned. I think one of the things, th th there is this good debt which people take and uh, they start a business and then the business is very profitable, then they can pay that debt and then they can make a decent profit. But I think the debt which you have mentioned, the most dangerous debt is this bad debt, the mm -hmm. consumption debt. The debt which is simply wired in you keeping alive. Because the truth is, debt is as pain. So for example, if I have no, no supper tonight, and then I tell Bernice, do you have 50,000? It eases the pain of now, only mm -hmm. that I have to meet Bernice tomorrow and pay her. Yes. So that is where the problem is seated, that, that, that consumption debt. And I feel like one of the things which you absolutely need to do is to get out of the cycle of consistently doing it. Because most people, they talk about mortgages because it's the banks which have them. But their greatest debt is right next to them. Mm -hmm. It is with family members, it's with workmates. And you have kind of outlived your credit worthiness. No one is willing mm -hmm. to lend you and you have to find new people to actually take money from. So I feel like that is the lifestyle which you need to stop. Because it's a lifestyle which you can sustain when you're working because you have a job. Mm -hmm. You tell everyone, you know what, I work with this organization. They say, okay, good, I'll lend you some money. Mm -hmm. But it's more difficult if you're not working. But it's a very, diff diff a very, very difficult lifestyle to retire with. Because if you retire with it, who will you be borrowing from mm -hmm. to make sure that you answer the needs of the day? So jumping out of that lifestyle of always taking credit to solve the immediate problem is, for me, one of the things which you absolutely need to do. Okay. Mm -hmm. well, well, speaking of evaluating our income in mm -hmm. relation to debt, but now bringing it uh, to something else, what investments do you, do you then plan to get into? Because I, I've, I've had a lot of my friends start planning for their NSSF money before they're mm -hmm. even, you know, close to the age. But then all of these plans are, I want to do this when I get that money. How do I know that this investment I'm planning for, for this big chunk of money that I'm sure I'm not going to get back again because I'm not going to grow any younger, yeah? Mm -hmm. How do I know that this investment I'm thinking about is viable for my retirement years? Well, the, that is a very interesting question because uh, when people think about the lump sum they get from NSSF, they look at it as capital to start a business. Mm. But uh, I would like to urge you that this is uh, money that is meant for your retirement. So whatever you decide to do has to be in line with making sure that you live a decent life. So if you think about doing the capital intensive projects or you buy land in the village where you've never been, it, it creates problems. So really when you are going to retire and you're choosing investments, you should be choosing investments that you are building on, assuming you've been having a project already going on, maybe you want to finish up a project. Like you see the NSSF, they say friends with benefits. When you see the cases that we have, you see that people have been doing something, mm -hmm. then they're just completing it yeah. or they're just enhancing it. Mm -hmm. The expectation is that you should be able to have some liquidity. You have liquidity until the time when you die. You don't want to get the money and then you start things afresh. You inject all the money in a capital intensive project and you have nothing to live on. So the important thing is to make sure that you assess what you have. If it is a small business, if it is a, a project, maybe you have rentals or some have schools or whatever it is at your level. You just try to make sure that you enhance it because you're now going to be engaged in it. But your focus should be liquidity so that you have money that can take you along. Okay. Mm. Uh, one question for you though. Um, is, is this ma money from the pension money, uh, NSSF money, is it taxed at the end of the day? Uh, well, uh, the model that is available now is that uh, when you make your contributions, the contributions are on the gross. So you, you're not taxed on your contribution. So if you have uh, one million as your paycheck, then you'll have the 15 percent, that is your, the year five and, and, and the employer 10, goes straight to NSSF pre-tax. And then as uh, the money is invested, the investment income is taxed, then in the end, you get your lump sum that is not taxed. So it is exempt contributions, tax, the investment income, and then exempt, 
the lump sum payment, the benefit you get at the end. That's why sometimes uh, uh, you, you think that uh, we could do more when we think about saving. For instance, we could up our contributions uh, to NSSF or to other supplementary schemes. Because then you have money that you're saving, that is pre-tax, and you can benefit from it. So yeah. I, ca I can go to my employer and say, instead of 5% now, I want to start giving 10% to NSSF. Yes, on yes. top of your 10%. Yes, you can up your contribution. Even when you are in a supplementary scheme, you can up your contribution. Because what it helps is that even when it is a nominal contribution, the compounding of uh, the savings and the interest that you get, when you look back after 20, 30 years, you will be pleased with what you would have achieved. And we're speaking about inflation mm. in that regard, <laughs> yes. I'd, I'd like to hear your, w w the explanation you gave when it came to, to the worry that that money in, in 30 years when we get to retire, mm. he's going to have lost quite a bit of value. Mm. I, I, th I think it's a, it's, it's, it's a genuine worry. And uh, I think the task which NSSF has to, to deal with is to ensure it is returning above inflation mm -hmm. so that the net, if the net effect. And I think to date it has been a bit like that. And uh, I think for me, that is the worry which people would genuinely have. And I think that's why we have to be interested in the in the in the macro economy is uh, is uh, is the interest rate in such a way that we are not we w that, that the value of our investment is not is not declining and I feel like that's a debate if if ever they are talking about the economy of the nation that's why I'm interested as an individual because I want to know whether this money which I have saved is actually going mm -hmm. to be of the same value when I get it but I think uh, I think I wanted to also add one small just thing. very quickly yes. before we take a break oh, yes thank you no oh, just quickly yes. Well, I think one small thing is, if it, the, the, the thing is that the five percent which I've saved in NSSF, I kept the ninety-five percent. So the question is, has NSSF done better than me as an individual? <laughs> because NSSF at least has my money, yes? and where is mine? So that's the question. Wait, yeah, exactly. that's the big question. <laughs> yes, the, the, the ninety-five percent. <laughs> okay, let's take a short break, and we'll be right back. Welcome back. Thank you for staying with us. We're coming to you from the Kampala Serena Conference Center and Nile Room, and we're still talking about planning for retirement. And I wanted to ask, um, so when we talk about NSSF and all of these things, it's for, for most people in the corporate world, right? Yes. What happens to people in the business world who are not a part of this mandatory saving? How do they help themselves? Or, well, they might mm -hmm. actually be better off than we are, but mm -hmm. how do they, if they wanted to have something mm -hmm. close to this? Yes, uh, in SSF, even uh, when it is uh, private businesses, as long as uh, you have uh, five employees and above, you are supposed to contribute mandatory. Those that are outside the eligibility age, actually part of the amendments proposed now is to ensure that everybody that has an enterprise, a business, you contribute for all, all your employees even when you have just one. Just the proposal. Uh, there are uh, presented to cabinet okay. and we're waiting for a decision but what else can people do those that are not within the bracket of the mandatory contributions uh, there are a number of uh, uh, insurance firms and that have come up with products and uh, we've licensed uh, umbrella schemes that have the option of making individual contributions okay. you contribute for yourself because what we have uh, the biggest percentage uh, about uh, 95% uh, employer-sponsored uh, retirement plans, just like you see with NSSF and the supplementary schemes. And uh, what's uh, really depressing is that the same people that are making contributions to the NSSF are, are the, the ones, ones that have are contributing to supplementary so schemes. So how does somebody, do they come to Uber and say, I would like to, where do they go? Uh, what you do is that, what we do is to license. We license and uh, we on our website and in the news we indicate that these are licensed these are license. okay. umbrella schemes, these are individual schemes. So we've been piloting two schemes. One is uh, called Mazima Retirement Plan. I don't know if you heard about it, targeting the informal sector. Mm. But uh, we've been trying to set up the framework, the regulatory framework, to make sure that the running of the business uh, is safeguards so members. Safe. Yes, but that kind of arrangement is to help those that are not under 
in a kind of arrangement, employer-employee relationship. So okay. you do your contributions just out of your own vol volition. You say, well, I'm going to contribute this percentage to this individual scheme. So you have an individual retirement account. Right. Well, because our time is quickly running out, I want us to look at a few things, but very quickly. Reviewing your estate plan, so things like your will, at what point, as you're planning for your retirement, do you, or is it something you should even do now before you start planning for retirement? Just to mm -hmm. cover your children and spouse and... But it's <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that can happen concurrently though, because one speaks into another, you know? You're saving towards retirement, and for some even go as far as, okay, in case I die before I reach that point, mm -hmm. this money should go to my beneficiaries. So, but we need to put it in writing somewhere because yes. we know what happens after. Yeah, yes, yeah. absolutely. It's so that in the event that that happens, then when they're reading it out, it is clear. Indeed, most of the problems have come because there's been no plan and then there's fighting and then the court comes in and it's quite a messy affair. Mm. And it would have been much easier yeah. and problems would have been solved if you said ABCD should go to this. And because estate planning is looking at your estate in totality, yes. retirement plans, provident funds, investment plans you have in totality, you know, and putting it out there and now planning and beginning to assign. So retirement is a subset of the, is a component of, of the will, because sometimes you may not reach to enjoy it actually, but you can leave it for your beneficiaries. I think Ben was saying it at one of the breaks that it will be your beneficiaries to use this money that has been put aside. Okay. Mm -hmm. and so f for somebody who is still much younger and they're not mm. thinking about retirement, maybe they're from the university and they're just thinking, how, how now do I start saving? How do I start mm. getting into this thing of, okay, I want to retire at 30, mm. yeah, and take my retirement money to a boat cruise. Mm. How do I, how do they start? <laughs> mm. I, think, I, think, I think the big word which we have been mentioning is this question of saving. Mm. And I think the government in its power has said you have to, put 5% aside as an individual. So it's kind of forcing us to save. But the majority of the saving we have to do in our lives is actually going to have to be voluntary. We are going to have to choose on our income that I will save this amount. I think for, for a young person, that's the question. And there are many options. I mean, uh, joining an investment club is an option. You mm -hmm. say, you know what, let's get together with a group of 20 friends and we put aside money. At the very least, even before you talk about the investment side, you learn the habit of saying at the end of every month, I will put aside this money. And investment clubs have gone into finding you if you don't come. I kind can of see try, you on TV uh, talking try, about trying to. <laughs> and I, I personally think it yeah. is, it's a way of disciplining yourself because yeah. discipline is a very difficult thing to do alone. Yeah. But when you're in a group of people, I mean, even circles are another option. And yeah. uh, even in, the, in the, whichever village you may think about, at that level, you can have a group of people who you are putting money with. There are definitely questions on how safe your money is. And I think there, there are efforts now to make sure there is a better regulatory framework. But I think on an individual basis, you have to make the decision because if you don't save, yeah. you are paying everyone else apart from yourself. Everyone will get your money apart from you who has made it. Okay. So saving is a way of paying yourself. All right. yes. I wanted to add still about the university um, students. Mm. And saving can be as basic as even just putting money aside in an account, you know, because the discipline is not always easy. But just to even develop the habit of removing 20,000 or 10,000 and leaving it there, it's amazing how much it can grow. But you see, even to get to that, normally the argument is I don't have enough to save. Me, I can save that 100,000 because I don't have. But we're saying at whatever point, I'm sure you've heard of a story of one who used to put aside coins every day. I don't know that was 500. Every day. Every day, every day, every day. Think about what you use. Just every day. Just for you to see the power of putting money aside, how much it can grow. You look back and you say, wow, you know. So once you have that discipline, even when you're in an investment club, then it becomes easier. Because remember, with the investment club, you must trust each other. You know how we are all on our guard. Ha. If I put my money there, will I find it? Mm -hmm. So it begins with us. I've said it a lot in the show, but it, everything begins with us. So putting money aside slowly, even a basic account, whatever it is, and it's nice putting it aside where you can't reach so that now it slowly grows. And you look back at the end of the six months, you say, okay, you mean I have like 300,000 or 200,000? That just shows you the power of saving and putting money aside. Yes, mm. I mean, I know we've said NSS quite a bit, but I think that's the one place where you look back and you actually realize mm. this 5% mm. that I would have mm. used for this or that. Mm. 
became this over this period of time. Mm. Money that you wouldn't normally have saved on your own. Wouldn't be yes, I'm glad actually that you said that because when you look at the savings to GDP for Sub-Saharan Africa, it's very low. It's about 19%. So actually we don't save. Mm. So the only way that you could encourage across the board is having mandatory saving. You force people to save. Nominal <laughs> savings and then you compound <laughs> later. They'll appreciate and you later. Yes, They'll thank you later. <laughs> yes, I think that's a very good thing. Okay, yes. I, so my final question to you, and I'll start with you and we'll go to wrap up. How do you retire in Uganda? <laughs> Where? Your answers are a wrap up for this question, <laughs> for our conversation in yes. retirement. How do you retire in Uganda? Yes, to retire in Uganda with dignity, I think if you are having an arrangement with NSSF or these uh, employer schemes, you retire with dignity by planning well when you get your lump sum. But uh, if you are not in a business, if you are not in the business of saving with ret any retirement plan, then you have to be creative about setting up mm -hmm. things that will bring in some liquidity as you retire. So it's something you have to have at the front, not the back of your mind to say I need to have something that will bring in money so that's your own way of having inflows during the time when you're no longer active okay right. um, yeah I was going to speak to that and maybe it can also be a checklist something that we underlook at retirement you need something that gives you regular income name it whatever it is whether it is rental income from your rentals whether because the investments out there that can give you regular income every month because we underestimate that you know you get your income like you said for capital intensive purposes you have your lump sum from nssf you buy a house you buy land and that's where it ends then tomorrow you can't buy tomatoes why because where you've invested in and someone is saying but this lady has a house and land how can she not afford tomatoes we forget that those regular needs that you need still that continue even in retirement need something else to speak to them what is that before maybe you had a salary something regular yeah. but when that goes remember these other things don't stop coming even in your own house you still pay bills and and what so what speaks to that if everything is tied up in intensive intensive capital intensive ventures mm -hmm. so for me one is to ensure you have some passive income of some sort because then that gives you peace of mind i can sleep and wake up and know okay money will come but it's very stressful to not have that regular income from somewhere mm -hmm. and like you said there are fund managers who have collective investment schemes that can give you that sort of regular income okay. but also at retirement to be able to do the things you like you know and give back so when you specifically said in Uganda, you make it seem like it's <laughs> hard to retire in Uganda. But I think to search yourself and see what are the things I would like to do in retirement, you know. If it's going to talk to the youth or teach or do some things now that I'm a bit lighter, children have grown, just to do things that I enjoy. But most importantly, have the income to do that. Because if you don't have money, then you cannot do many of these things we're talking about. So it starts with planning, planning, and planning. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to ask quickly. Uh, your I, I've had conversations quite a bit on, on engaging your, your passions. Mm. Can't your passions at a certain point be your source of income, mm. your passive source of income um, like, mm. when you retire? Things that you, mm. you, you know, you're passionate about. Maybe you write a book or mm. become a writer or a musician. Mm. They, they can, totally. Okay. They can. Mm. All right. Uh, I think I'll just speak more a bit on that. I think the point is that uh, retirement is closer than we think. It, yeah. it feels uh, distant, it feels like it's very distant from us, but it's much closer than we mm -hmm. think. And irrespective of the circumstances which cause you to retire, it may be closer. That means that it's something which you need to deal with tomorrow or actually now. So I think passive income is certainly one of the things you need to look at. And then what you are going to do, don't plan to do it in your retirement, plan to do it now. I think one of the problems is that sometimes when you're at your workplace, you get so engaged in your workplace that actually you think you will retire with your workplace, that it will continue <laughs> with you in this journey. But it will hand you over. However good you are at what you do, one time the workplace will say, we love what you have done, but thank you. And they'll put a picture of yours possibly on a wall somewhere too. But the point is that that day is going to what is going it's to come. Coming. So mm -hmm. if you have passions, then start working on them. If you are, if you are a writer, attempt to write something. And it doesn't have to make you money now, mm -hmm. but you have gotten into the game of mm -hmm. actually starting to do it. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you love gardening, attempt to do gardens for some of your friends. Do them for free if that's what it takes. But after you have three clients, now you can possibly sell that service. Yeah. The point is that 
don't think that the a point we reach and now I've crossed over, now I need to start doing everything. And I'll say one last thing about investment. When you get that NSSF money, if you haven't touched that thing, if you haven't understood that investment, it's a very dangerous thing to say you are going to dive in. So you say, you know what, I want to get into trucks and I use my all the money I got from NSSF to buy a truck. You send it to Fort Porto and they mm -hmm. tell you, it has by the way disappeared into Congo and mm. it's gone. <laughs> it's, uh, and, uh, and this is all your money. So yeah. you, you make sure that you put the money in what you understand, what you know, and uh, play safe, play safe mm. at that point. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, all Thanks of you, so. Benjamin, Bernice, uh, Ronald. Thank you so much for taking the time uh, to educate us and inform us these last two Sundays. We really, really appreciate um, the information we've gotten from you. Well, that wraps up our show, our last two shows on, on preparing for retirement, and we certainly hope that you've picked something from them that is helpful to you at whatever point you are in your life. Well, that's it for our show for tonight. Coming up is NTV Weekend Edition. Keep it NTV. Renew your monthly basic bouquet subscription of 18,000 shillings before it expires. Then enjoy three free days only on Star Times. Enjoy digital life.